Welcome everybody. My name is Leia. I am the Director of Alumni at Ramaz. Uh, for those of you that are Ramaz alumni, parents, community members, welcome. For those of you that are not, welcome. Uh, I am so excited to welcome you to our wonderful program this afternoon. Uh, from surviving to thriving in an unpredictable world, practical tools to calm yourself, think clearly, and function well when you feel like you're losing it with Dr. Dina, Diane, Weishagrad, Blotkorski. Just froze. Oh no. Can you see me now? Yeah. There we go. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you all here with us and to have Dr. Dina. Uh, Dr. Dina joins us. Uh, is she is a licensed clinical and medical psychologist and a certified teacher and trainer of mindfulness-based training reduction. Dina pioneered bringing MBSR to Israel in 2002. For more than 30 years, she has been teaching mindfulness approaches to thousands of people from all over Israel, as well as internationally. She integrates this approach with other cutting edge techniques into her clinical work to help people not just cope, but heal, not just survive, but thrive. In addition, since 2009, together with her no friend, idea how frustrated I am with this. Um, not just, uh, uh, not just together with her friend and colleague, uh, Rachel Oserna, Dina has led her mindfulness tour, an annual week, annual two week trip to India and Africa, which integrates sightseeing and mindfulness. And during these unique tours, people learn techniques that sharpen their senses hone their abilities, take in more of life's wonders, and enable them to navigate their lives more successfully back home. Dina fervently hopes that once this crazy corona time is finally over, which here in New York, I don't know where everyone is right now, but here in New York, it's finally starting to look. We finally see that light at the end of the tunnel. She'll be back on the road and leading the next breathtaking adventure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Dr. Dina. I'm so excited to have you here with me. I'm so excited to have everybody here. Uh, how are you doing today, Dina? How are you doing? Me? I'm yeah, how are you? <laughs> I'm terrific. Good, good. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Leah. I'm, it's really fun to be here. Um, so it's kind of a weird way to be back home in Ramaz. <laughs> And I have to tell you that I always get a kick out of it when it doesn't go to according to plan. <laughs> of course, that's what this training is all about. You know, what do we do when things don't go according to plan? How do we live with it? How do we work with it? And as I, you know, as you said in the introduction, you know, how do we move from surviving it to actually thriving, actually overcoming it and, and learning from it and, and being able to not just cope, but do better. So that's what I hope to be able to convey in a short period of time. Well, for me, it's night. So for you, it's day. I'm seven hours ahead of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, it's, it's this, you've, you've picked a, a beautiful time. We picked a beautiful time to be together um, here, uh, here in New York. Uh, I'm here in New York. It's beautiful and sunny outside. Uh, for anybody who's, uh, for wherever you are, I just want to let everybody know throughout today's conversation, please feel free to put your thoughts in the chat. Um, our chat is open to whoever likes it. You're more than welcome to uh, uh, put your thoughts uh, in the chat. If you have any questions throughout this afternoon's program, please feel free to uh, put them there. Uh, today's uh, program is going to work like this. Uh, Dr. Dina and I are going to have a conversation. We're going to talk about uh, mindfulness and a mindfulness practice, how she got into it, and how we all can incorporate it into our everyday lives. Uh, we're going to have a practice together. Dr. Dina is going to lead us uh, in, a, in a short practice. And then we're actually going to have an opportunity to sort of talk about it, uh, what worked, what didn't work, how we can work on it together. Uh, and then uh, we'll, be, we'll be sharing uh, Dr. Dina's information. And so if you have any questions that you'd like to talk to her about offline, you can do that, but we will have time for a Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, ask her about those here. Um, so uh, if anybody has any thoughts that they'd like to share, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Everybody should be able to chat with each other, uh, myself uh, and uh, Dr. Dina. 
Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started, because uh, I know we had a bit of a late start. Uh, that's one of the things, you know, uh, I just took a deep breath when you sent me that email that it wasn't working. I was just like, whew, you know, uh, 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 as, a, as a director of alumni, you know, we do a lot of events. And uh, one of the things that I had to, that I learned very early on is that you can plan and plan and plan and nothing ever goes according. You know, if you've ever planned a bar mitzvah, a wedding, a bris, anything, you know, you've ever had a Shabbos meal, you know, something is going to go wrong and you just have to figure out how it's going to work. And some people do that better than others. Um, and so I was just like, okay, I got to figure out how to make a new link. I got to send it out. I got to do it. I got to get it done. Boop, boop, boop. One, two, three, all done. Um, so let's talk. Uh, how did you get into uh, mindfulness? I know you have a background in psychology, but maybe take us back a little bit. Maybe talk about your Ramaz experience. How did you, how did you maybe go back a little, a little further, delve into your, into your history a little bit more? How did you get into this? All right. I, um, let me just briefly say that if, if you had asked me at Ramaz, and I dare say I see some of my uh, classmates on the line, if you asked me that then whether I would be doing this now, I would have told you that there was absolutely no way I would be doing meditation. Because to me at the time, meditation meant something very bizarre. My associations to it were seeing Hare Krishna folks bouncing around New York and uh, looking very strange. And I was extremely, you know, conservative in my approach. And I thought, you know, not, that has nothing to do with me. But, you know, I mean, even tonight what happened, I mean, you know, this afternoon on your side, you know, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans, is what John Lennon famously said. So the cosmos apparently had other plans for me. And as a psychologist, I was always very interested in finding very practical, very usable ways to work with helping people cope with anxiety, with stress. I was also, my expertise is also in behavioral medicine. So the idea is to help people cope with, uh, with illnesses. And I was always on the lookout for new tools and new techniques. And one of them that I eventually found was meditation. This was in the 70s when things like guided imagery and relaxation training and things like that became much more part of the scene. And so at some point I sort of stumbled on meditation. I thought it was, you know, it was interesting, but I still had no idea that this would be a direction that would become a major part of my life. But, um, you know, in one of those shared moments, I met someone who had a very interesting- Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. But Dina, it's very difficult to hear you. It seems as if your volume keeps going in and out. That's probably my internet connection, unfortunately, because I'm not doing anything different here. Should I? You know what? Hang on. I think you should take a microphone or, you know, like, um, like, um, uh, ear, ear, head, 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 uh, Maybe it's you know, your headphones. Maybe it's your headphones. Exactly. Don't headphones. Have headphones. I can hang You have them in your ears, sweetie. Let me try one more thing and see if this helps. All right, I'm gonna to switch to these guys. In the meantime, you guys get a chance to breathe. Let me see if this helps at all. Hang on a second. One second. Okay, let me try this. All right, let's see if this works. If not, we're just going to have to wing it. It sounds, it sounds great now. If this is better. Sounds great. What? Sounds great. Sound is good? Yeah. All right. I know that sometimes the internet goes in and out, so I'm, I'll do the best I can. Okay. Let's do it this way. Anyway, I met someone who seemed very normal, mm -hmm. okay, and he meditated. I mean, he had a very compelling story. He told me that he'd been in a, tra in a car accident in which his wife was killed 
his back was destroyed and he had to cope with all of the above. And the doctors whom he consulted about the back said, listen, you're just going to have to learn to live with this. And he said, I couldn't. And so he began his own search and he, it brought him to meditation. And that was a, a pretty compelling testimonial. And I thought, all right, um, I have to look into this. And he actually volunteered to take me to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Transcendental Meditation Center, the TM Center, which at that time was on 24th Street in Manhattan. And I went and I started my journey. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't like it initially. I couldn't make sense of it. And eventually, oh, I stuck with it for, for some reason. I'm not even sure why. I don't know mm -hmm. why I didn't just toss the whole thing because it didn't make much sense. But then I found the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, which was developed by John Kabat-Zinn in the 70s at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And in his seminal book, Full Catastrophe Living, I found a lot of explanations about why meditation and mindfulness work, which spoke to me as a psychologist. I wasn't looking for anything spiritual. I wasn't looking for another religion. I figured I had enough with my own religion. I don't need to add anything else into the mix. So I was looking for something practical and powerful and that had research backing it up and that was grounded and that seemed sane. And okay. I all of that in the mindfulness-based stress reduction program and so Got I trained in it and I decided at some point that this would be my literally my contribution to Israel I said I'm going to study it I'm going to learn it I'm going to be certified in it because there's a whole procedure there and I'm going to bring it here and that's lovely what lovely so that's how I got into it Amazing. Um, so you mentioned a few things uh, that I just want to uh, make sure that we clarify. Uh, mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, mindfulness, you mentioned, you mentioned TM, um, transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just clarify just for anyone who doesn't know what the difference is between, you know, meditation okay. versus transcendental meditation, mindfulness, right. you know, what those, what those things mean, how they're different and, and right. what, what specifically uh, you, what, what you do specifically and how that's different from all those other spaces and okay. what MBSR is. Wow. Well, in a few minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> can take your time. You. Take your time. All right. So let's, let's start with a definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness mm -hmm. is defined as paying attention mm -hmm. deliberately on purpose to what's happening to you right here and now in the present moment and doing so non-judgmentally. Okay. So let me take those pieces apart. Much of the time we're on autopilot. We're doing things by rote, sort of by habit. Um, that's very efficient. It's very effective a lot of the time. I mean, you wouldn't want to have to relearn how to tie your shoes every morning or how to relearn how to drive your car every time you slide behind the wheel. The problem is that it can cost us. It, for, first of all, it costs us in terms of quality of life. So for example, if you're busy wolfing down a sandwich and multitasking, you can completely miss what you're eating which of course also has ramifications, not only for quality of life, but for weight and things like that. So that's one thing. It can also be deadly. I mean, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, it can kill you. Um, we, a few years ago, a cousin of ours, a young cousin was celebrating Yom Yerushalayim here in Jerusalem. He was very excited. He was dancing with his friends and he was on the phone with his mom and he danced into the crosswalk and he got hit by a car and he spent months in rehab trying to get back to normal. So his sort of autopilot, his rote behavior really cost him. So autopilot can really cost us in terms of the quality of our life. It can really kill us if we're not careful. And it also has a lot to do with the emotional reactivity that we get involved with and how we respond to stress. Okay, it's an antidote to stress. Now, before I say any more about that, let me just answer your questions and then we can go over to the other stuff. So there are a lot of different ways in which we can learn to be more mindful. In other words, to be more present. What does that mean? That means that the mind is often, if you pay attention to yourself and then you do a few little bits of exercise, you'll see the mind is often skipping around. It's extremely frisky and jumpy and undisciplined. And where it often goes is it rehashes the past. It's like, if only this, if only that, which often leads us to feel depressed, or it skips over into the future. It's you know, what if this, what if that? And the safest place for us to be actually is right here in the middle in the present. You know, in fact, if you think of, let's say a seesaw, 
if you were to stand on the seesaw, you're most balanced, you're most safe, it, right in the middle at the fulcrum, okay? If you try to stand at either of the ends, which are going up and down, if you think of those as past and future, unless you're one hell of an athlete, you're gonna go flying, okay? So when we are mindful, we're learning how to be more attuned to what's happening to us. We're learning how to be more present in, in the sense of being aware right. and also in the present. And the other piece that we add to that mix is non-judgmentally, which is not an easy thing for us to do because we tend to be very self-critical. We tend to be pretty harsh and we're constantly making judgments about how we're doing and how things are going. And this is a very tall order to ask us to notice what we're experiencing and let it be there without fighting with ourselves. Now, this is, anything I said so far, if you're paying attention, has nothing to do with a particular spiritual practice has nothing to do with a particular religion. I think every every religion, every spiritual practice, every way of being will say you will tell you that it's probably a good idea every once in a while to step out of autopilot and to be more present and to connect with yourself. Now, if somebody wants to bring that to a spiritual practice and wants to use it as a way to connect to God or supreme power or however you want to define it, that's up to them. But one of the innovations of the mindfulness-based stress reduction program was it left out all of that stuff. So whereas TM, for example, was based in a more Hindu Indian background with some of the trappings that went along with that, um, which would make it unacceptable to the way that I have to teach here in Israel and to the clientele that I'm working with, because I work with people across the spectrum where people are going to be very suspicious of anything that smacks of any other type of religious affiliation. And there's no reason for it. Again, it should be a choice. But everyone who wants to be able to be more attuned to the moment should have access to this. And there's so much research in the last 20 or 30 years that shows that when you are more mindful in this way, you can actually improve your, your health, you can reduce your anxiety and your stress, you enhance your creativity, uh, your focus, you change things in the brain that are related to greater equanimity, a greater sense of balance. Mm -hmm it has tremendous benefits and it should be available to everyone across the board without any specific religion or religious affiliation getting into it. Now, it happens to be that the Buddhists, I mean, going back to Siddhartha, a book that we read in high school, which interestingly enough, nobody mentioned to us that that was the story of the Buddha, at least as far as I remember. My classmates can, can check me on that. But you know, he wasn't a Buddhist either. That was a label that was attached to it in the 1800s. So he was just looking for a way to reduce suffering and, and live a better, more, you know, higher quality of life kind of existence. So if someone is interested in those, that kind of background, terrific. You know, there's tremendous amount of research and, and readings and literature and all that out there. But if for someone that's working with me or for myself, what I was looking for was something, as I said, grounded, stable, research-based, powerful, and practical. And that's what I found in terms of this approach. Now, the other the thing you asked me is how this relates to meditation. They are related, but they're not the same. Okay. You can be mindful anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances. If you were, for example, aware that as you set this meeting up tonight or today, I keep forgetting you're seven hours behind me, <clears throat> when you were beginning to, uh, like, uh-oh, this isn't working. If you were aware that there was a certain level of activation in your body at that moment, which I'm assuming there may have been, you know, a certain level of charging up, okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to take a breath? You were being mindful. You were being mindful of the increased activation. You were being mindful of the need to take a breath. You were being aware of taking the breath. All of that's mindfulness, okay? None of that was doing a so-called meditation. Meditation is kind of setting up a formal structure that lets us practice mindfulness. But you can be mindful when you're walking your dog, when you're taking out your garbage, when you're diapering your baby, when you're answering the phone, or when you're reaching for, you know, opening the fridge, everywhere and anywhere across the board. And it doesn't take any extra time. It has to do with the attention that you bring to what you are doing. If you're fully present to whatever it is, remember that's a non-judgmental piece. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether you don't care one way or another, as long as you're aware in this way, you are by definition being mindful. 
Now, if you want to set aside a certain amount of time to practice this more formally, then you can do what we call meditation. And there are many different forms of that. And I hope that we'll have a few minutes to do a little bit together so you get a chance to, to test it out for yourself. So take a moment and see if this is an answer to your question. And if there are things that are left that I didn't cover that you would like me to cover. No, I think I think that's I think that's enough. I think that was good. That was good. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about the, the practical. How do we actually do this? How do we create a personal practice? How does one go about doing that? Okay. I would start slightly different. I would okay. say, first of all, how do you integrate moments of mindfulness into your life? Because one okay. of the things that I'd like people to walk away from this this time together is, is something that they can take right into their lives, okay? And that's a technique that I call the STOP, right? In other words, STOP is an acronym, and it stands for, first of all, S means just stop. You know, stop and step out of autopilot. Just notice the fact that you need to do a stop. Notice that you're ratcheting up in some way. Notice that you're getting worked up about something. Notice that you're you know, let's take the food, reaching for the fridge when you may be, maybe not hungry, okay? So that, taking yourself off of autopilot is the first step, right? Then the T stands for take a breath. Now, the breath is one of our most powerful allies because it's very sensitive to the emotional changes in the body, and it can serve as a bridge between mind and body and being in the present moment. We can only breathe here and now. You can't breathe yesterday, you can't breathe tomorrow. So if we're talking about the present being the safest place for us to be, when we're actually aware of taking a breath and we're actually breathing, we are in the present. So how it's good, we're gonna do it. Let's just take, you know, just take a breath. Any way you wanna breathe is fine. Okay, you don't have to breathe big and you don't have to breathe deep and you just, just breathe. Just be aware of breathing. Feel yourself breathing in, feel yourself breathing out. You can just do one conscious breath. You can do it with your eyes open or closed, by the way. I tend by now to close my eyes all the time, but there's no reason why you have to, okay? Whatever feels better for you. Then the O in the stop means observe. You know, notice what's going on with you. Be present, be aware. So that means, what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling emotionally? What's my mood like, okay? And how's my body? What are the sensations that I'm aware of in my body right now? That's the O. So it's just an objective observation. It's a sort of assessment, turning you into your own personal scientist. Like what is going on inside of me right now? How am I doing? What's my state of being? And then once you've done that, once you've stopped and stepped out of autopilot, once you've taken this breath, once you've observed what's going on inside of me right now, or what's happening to me, and also maybe what's happening around me, then you can get to the last letter, which is the P, which is proceed. Okay, now what do I need to do next? Now, sometimes people think that this is, you know, major like celestial choirs you're gonna start singing, it's gonna be this major thing. It can be very simple. It can be as easy as saying, you know, I, I'm hungry, I haven't eaten in a while, I need to eat something, or I need to drink something, or I need a bathroom break, or I, I, you know, I need a nap, okay, or I need to call a friend. You know, it it's, can be really anything based on your assessment. And this is something you can do anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances. And I recommend that you just, you know, get into the habit of using it every time you need it. I recommend to people that when you see a stop sign, when you, um, here in Israel, you have a lot of student drivers driving around, which often make people crazy because they're stuck <laughs> behind the driver. Well, nowadays, nobody's driving around that much. But anyway, when you are behind a student driver and they have a little sign up, it says, you know, it tells you, oh, I'm stuck. Use it as an opportunity. You can know, you, can you repeat the, the stop again? What is it? What? Can you repeat what the STOP stands for one yeah. more time? So the S stands for stop and step out stop. of autopilot. Okay. The T is for take a breath. Okay. The O is for observe. observe. Like what am I thinking? What am I feeling emotionally? And what am I sensing in my body? Mm -hmm. And then P is, okay, proceed. What do you need to do next? All right. So I hope to run us through that a couple of times just 
in this short period of time together. Mm -hmm. So that's the informal practice. Now, the formal practice is you set aside a certain amount of time and a certain place. It helps to have a place. It helps to have some props set aside. So you don't have to run around each time you're going to do this practice to find all your stuff. So it makes you, it makes it, you know, more comfortable for you. And then you, um, you set an intention that I'm going to spend these few minutes to do a particular practice. Would you like to do one right now? Well, when you say props, what do you mean by that? Blankets, pillows, okay. you can meditate anywhere. Okay. Let sure. Me first, you know, you don't have to buy, there's a, look, mindfulness has become a multi-billion dollar industry. Sure. All right. So they're going to try to sell you all kinds of fancy pillows and blankets and pillows, <laughs> whatever. All you need is yourself, yourself, awareness, and your intention and your attention. Okay. You can meditate anywhere under any circumstances. Okay. If you like to sit on a floor on the on a cushion, you know, go ahead. If you like to sit on a chair, you can do that. If you want to lie down and do it lying down you can do it lying down you want to stand up you can stand up there's even a practice for walking okay so again it, you know the only reason that i say if you're going to use any props try to have them all in one place at one time because we're not the most disciplined creatures on the <laughs> planet it makes it harder for us to kind of do something unless we have everything set up for sure. us Sure. So, so yeah, let's 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 do one now. Let's give everyone a minute to sort of get themselves comfortable. Yeah, uh, you, feel you know, free. Get, yeah, yeah, feel free to. I'm just talking to everybody. Feel free to Go turn your it. cameras on so that um, Dr. Dina can give you a little a little peek and make sure you're you know following along. Uh, get let, me, your, let me let me interrupt you for a second. You sure. Have to do that <laughs> or not? Of course, of Sorry. course. This is about. Look. This is a very personal uh, yeah. headspace right. that you want to be in. So yeah. make yourselves comfortable, like like she said, either on the floor, on your couch, in a chair, in bed, whatever, wherever space you feel comfortable. Um, and 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 Dina, I'll let you obviously take over because okay. I'm not I'm not leading right. this session. So yeah, the, the no the issues that you're raising are really important. Um, it's extremely important that whatever you do, you feel comfortable and you feel safe, right? So that's very personal, all right? If you find that you're better off with your eyes open, then you leave your eyes open. Some people feel really uncomfortable closing their eyes. Now, it's interesting because we're on Zoom, so you have the choice of closing the video and like, you know, shutting yourself off behind the screen or leaving it open. And I'd really encourage you to check in with yourselves and see what works best for you right now, what makes you feel most comfortable. I'm going to be talking you through it anyway. So it, you don't, like, I don't need to see you and you don't necessarily need to see me either. I mean, there's not a lot to look at. I'm going to sit here with my eyes closed. Not the most interesting movie in town. All right. So making yourselves as comfortable as you can be. If you are sitting up, you know, making sure that your feet are comfortably placed on the floor so you can feel the sense of grounding through your feet. And you can feel your buttocks and your back against the chair if you're in a chair. If you're lying down, then seeing if you're feeling comfortable and supported. And if someone were to do this standing up, then again, feel the contact between your feet and the floor. And inviting yourself to connect with your intention, which is at least for our purposes for right now, is to practice being present and to practice focusing the mind. Now, what you're going to notice is that mind wanders. That's just what minds seem to do, at least much of the time. So what we're going to do with this practice is we're going to give the mind something to focus on. And that thing for the moment is going to be the fact that we're breathing. Now, I'm going to invite you to just notice the fact that you're breathing anywhere in your body that's easiest for you to connect with it. So some people find it easier to be aware of the breath through the nostrils. And some people find it easier to focus at the chest, feeling the expansion and the contraction of the chest. Some people find it easier to focus on the belly feeling the belly rise 
on the in breath and fall back down on the out breath. There's no right or wrong on this. If you remember what I talked about before about non judgmental, whatever it is, it is. It's, this is a decision you're going to make between you and your own body. So once you've decided that, at least for these next few moments, this is where in my body it's easiest for me to be aware of the breath. Seeing if you can keep your attention on the fact that you're breathing. And you don't have to breathe a particular way either. This is not an exercise in deep breathing or in belly breathing or yogic breathing or anything like that. Just let the breath breathe itself. So you'll notice that some breaths will be long and some will be short and some will be deep and some will be shallow. Whatever it is, it is and it's okay. So seeing if you can be aware that when you're breathing in, be aware of breathing in. You can even say that to yourself in your, in your mind, you know, breathing in, I'm aware of breathing in. And breathing out, I'm aware of breathing out. So that at least for that split second of time, your mind and your body and your breath are all in the same place, on the same page. And it's my guess that by now you've probably noticed at least once that your mind wanders. Okay, and that's what minds do. So we do not make a big fuss about it. In fact, the fact that you notice it, the fact that you're aware of it means that you are mindful of it. If you remember the definition, it's aware of whatever is happening without judging it. So noticing that the mind is no longer on the breath is a very important observation. You can actually even notice where the mind has gone, what should the mind has gotten involved in, because that's also potentially really interesting information. You can even congratulate yourself for noticing, oh, mind just wandered. Okay, I caught you, I got it. And then you gently and firmly escort your attention back to the breath. And once again, you, you know, aware of breathing in as I'm breathing in, I'm aware of breathing out as I'm breathing out. I know what I'm doing as I do it. I am mindful. I am fully in the present. And so checking in again to see where is your attention now? Where is your mind now? And if it's wandering around again, well then again, oh, okay, I noticed it. Congratulations, I caught it. And now gently and firmly, I'm bringing my attention back. Breathing in, I'm aware of breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware of breathing out. And so before we bring this short practice to a close, I strongly encourage you to take a moment to really be grateful 
appreciate what you've just done. Because even these few moments help you reset your nervous system, your brain, your body. It's a way of training your attention and your focus. It's a way of learning how to be more present, more aware. It's a way of developing an, a greater attitude of acceptance, being non judgmental toward yourself, of being both gentle and firm. All of which has tremendous ramifications for our mental and physical well being. And if that isn't enough sort of bang for your buck, so to speak, it also turns out that when we do these practices, even though it seems like we're only doing this within ourselves, this has ramifications for the world around us. This stuff radiates out into the world so that we do this not only for our own good, but for the good of others as well. And to signal the practice, I'm going to ring these bells of mine three times so that you can help yourself make a gentle transition. If your eyes were closed, you may want to rub the palms of your hands together to warm them up and place them over your eyes to give your eyes a little bit of an extra treat. Obviously, those of us who wear glasses have to get the glasses out of the way. And then when you move your hands away from your face, it helps make a gentle transition also in terms of the light. Oh. And that is a very brief basic meditation, which is also referred to as the awareness of the breath or awareness of breathing. Oh, wow. I feel refreshed. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Um, if anyone has um, any thoughts, please feel free to um, put them in, in the chat. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, if this were a live class or yeah. if this were even a, you know, a, a, hopefully it can be interactive, then, then we all, I always ask people afterwards, like, what did you notice? You know, what did sure. you experience? Because that's where a lot of the information about how we react to things comes out. You know, right. these are not easy practices. They're challenging. Sure. You know, sure. So, so I'll, I'll go. Uh, I, I, I would love for people to share um, if what they felt. Please feel free to um, put your, your thoughts or, you know what, we can open this up actually. If you would like to share um, what you felt, please um, raise your hand. There's a way to do this. Um, it's, a, it's a function. Uh, you can raise your hand or, or put your name in the chat and I can unmute you and you can share your thoughts. I'll give everyone a moment to sort of decide if they would like to share. I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, I, 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 I realized, um, so I, I kind of felt uh, my breathing come from my chest. That's sort of normally how I, I usually sort of, when I do the, when I do deep breathing, but um, I had my hands um, on my keyboard because that's what I'm where I am right now. That's how I'm sitting. And I, and my, my, my feet were planted very firmly on the ground and I felt my my hands get very heavy mm -hmm. and I kind of let myself sort of like 
lean into that and I and I felt my hands get very very heavy and very warm and I, I thought a little bit that that was my mind was wandering a little and I thought myself maybe that's just the keyboard but then no 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 it was my hands and they were getting very warm and very heavy and then it kind of spread up my arms and then my feet were getting very warm and then I kind of just was sort of letting it just sort of take take over and it was sort of like very pleasant and I just kept breathing and that was very nice and then you know my mind stopped and just sort of like went a little blank and it was very nice um and uh and then i just and i just kept doing it and i kept doing it and 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 that's and that's usually how how that how that works for me i usually just sort of once i sort of once i sort of lean into the 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 thought process mm -hmm. my um my mind will, will, will you will you know stop wandering and i think that i, I don't i don't want to say that's how it works for everyone but from uh, what i understand that's sort of you know how it works um, does anyone have anything to share? Uh, is that is that what you would say? Is that how it works, Dina? Sort of. There is no how it works, mm -hmm. really. It's very different for different people. It's very different from experience to experience. One of the best attitudes you can take to this is just let's just see what happens. Sure. You know, because sure. every moment is a new moment. Every day is a new day. Every practice is a new practice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who knows how it's going to go the next time. Sure. You know, now, it happens to be, from a physiological standpoint, that when you get more relaxed, you may feel more warmth in the hmm. extremities. When we get anxious, anyone who's noticed, I mean, you get really tense, your hands can get very cold and clammy, hmm. you know, because there's a shift in the blood flow towards the more, accept the more important parts of the body, like the legs, so you can run away from the threat. Got it. So when you're feeling warmth in your hands or something like that, it can be a sign of relaxation. So, you know, that can be, can be very lovely and very pleasant. <laughs> but again, you know, when I talk about non-judgmental, if anyone had an experience that was not quite so pleasant, that still counts as a meditation. You know, sure. it, it can really go across the board from very unpleasant to very pleasant to very neutral. And everything counts, first of all, in terms of the practice. And we learn a tremendous amount from our different experiences and, and very importantly from our reactions to those experiences because we tend to go through life thinking, well, if it was a good experience, then that was a good meditation. And if it wasn't such a pleasant one, that was a bad meditation. And therefore, you know, I, I was good here and I was bad there. And this is a model that we've learned, you know, in school, at home. And sure. it's an invitation in these practices to take a different look mm -hmm. at the way in which we judge ourselves and the way in which we react to things and to do so in a less reactive and more balanced way with more equanimity so that you kind of, you know, you zoom in. Like when I talked to before about the stop, which is, you know, once again, to stop and get out of autopilot, to take that breath, to observe what you're feeling and thinking and, and experiencing in your body. You're kind of apropos zoom you're zooming in to specifically notice what you're experiencing then you're also sort of zooming out so all of the experience is getting closed in this sort of container of awareness what we call mindfulness everything you know so it's very different from the way we often divide up our experience and therefore ourselves this is good this is bad i'm okay i'm not okay and that has definitive consequences for our mental well-being. We're walking around, you know, constantly like balancing on eggshells. Like, am I okay? Am I not okay? Is, is the world okay? Is the world not okay? And this gives us a different view, a chance to look at it from a sort of bigger perspective and say, you know, whatever it is, it is. Now, we're not talking about external behavior here. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really important thing. I'm not saying everything goes in terms of how you act in the world. That's, right. not, that's not the case. What I'm talking about is our internal experience. You know, paying attention to the way in which, the, the way in which we judge ourselves, how does that show up in, our, in the way our minds work, in the way our bodies feel? And that's a sort of autopilot as well. You know, autopilot is not just how we behave in terms of our eating or our driving or something like that. It has everything to do with the way in which we've learned to interact with ourselves and with the world, the emotional autopilot that we're on. Mm -hmm. And that includes all that self-judgment. So when we say be non-judgmental about whatever it shows up, it's a pretty radical act. Right. 
You know, it's a very different perspective that we're inviting ourselves to take in response to ourselves. And that's, um, that has tremendous consequences for our mental and physical well-being. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, um, I wanna keep an eye on the time. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Dina before we wrap up this afternoon? Um, any questions about mindfulness, meditation, personal practice, anything like that? Please feel free to put them um, in the chat here. Um, I actually have a quick question. Um, just sort of about um, why, why potentially it's easier to have, you know, why one day it would be easier for meditation to do your practice versus another day it being more difficult. I know obviously it has to do with headspace and, you know, you know, wandering and things like that, but is there like a psychological reason or is it just sort of very much internal or, or is it external or is it everything? <laughs> You know, we, we are constantly reacting to mm -hmm. the world around us and to the world inside of us, right? Which is never stable. It's never right. the same. So if you're worried about something in your life or you turn on the news and you see what's going on out there, mm -hmm. that's, that's going to set us off. It's going to, we're going to have a very strong emotional reaction to some things. And that's going to enter into the meditation and it's not like you turn a switch you know and you know now i'm meditating so all the issues of the world stay outside and no i mean absolutely not they come into the meditation with us or mm -hmm. become part of our experience and it really should be that way because if, if we're going to learn to be able to handle those things then we have to be able to make space for them we have to be able to make space for the reactions that we're having to them and then on the basis of that, if you go back to that STOP little mm -hmm. acronym, okay, we have to basically, okay, notice what's going on with me at this moment, take a breath, observe how I'm feeling and how I'm thinking and how I'm sensing about that. So that means cognitively, like the mind, emotionally, and my emotional life and, and sensations like the body. What am I doing? How am I feeling about all this? How am I reacting to all of this? And then we can make a wise choice when we come back, you know, both inside the meditation and certainly outside the meditation, of how I would like to respond to this. You know, um, a quote that I really like that I'd like to leave you with. Sure. A quote by Viktor Frankl, who, as many of you may know, was an Austrian psychoanalyst, a survivor of Auschwitz, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, that's where we can find our freedom. So if you think of autopilot as this, you know, glomming together of stimulus and response, that if we are on autopilot, there is no space in there. We're stuck. We respond the way we respond which may be terrific for survival if we're facing a life or death situation in the real world right now. Yeah, your body better know what it's doing, and it does. You know? But since we tend to react as well to perceptions in the same way, okay, and the body reacts to like a picture of a lion, or if you think a lion is jumping at you almost the same way that if a real lion were jumping at you, it's probably not fair to do this to lions. But anyway, we would like to be able to create a space between the stimulus and the response so that we can make a wiser choice. Now, if you open the news, you know, as we've done over, you know, as I certainly did over the last few weeks and was just shaken by what I saw, I had to decide how to use that information. Do I watch a video, for example, of George Floyd late at night before I'm going to go to bed and take it into bed with me, take it into dreams with me? Or do I say to myself, you know, you get very reactive to these things. If you, you get very triggered by this, wait till the morning. Wait till you have more time and more space and more resources, and then watch the video. I mean, you know what's going on, keeping track of the news and all that. That's creating that space. That means that I don't get as swept along as often into the reactivity. You know, I'm not, you know, just dragged along by so-called the mob. Now the mob can be outside and the mob can be inside. Mm -hmm. The mob can be all of my crazy making thoughts, my overactive, 
you know, reactivity to things. And it can drag me along. Like, yes, you have to look at this right now. You know, social media says, look at it right now. No, I can notice there's the stimulus and there's the response. And can I, can I create that space? The conscious breathing that we do, the stop that we do, and ultimately even the meditation practices that we do are all designed to help us remember that we can create that space. And then from that space, as he pointed out so rightly, that's where our freedom is. That's where our ability to choose resides right in there. And then, of course, when we lose it, then we have lots and of opportunities to do it again. That's why we call it a practice, okay? Exactly. No one gets it right. No one gets it perfect. And that's just the way life goes. You know, exactly. So we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again. But I believe, and from my experience, both for myself and people that I work with, you really can make a significant change in your life with this. You really can learn to create that space. You can learn to respond more consciously, more thoughtfully, more lovingly to yourself and to others okay. around you. And, you know, again, as I said before, what we do for one of us is we're actually doing for everybody. You know, if I'm calmer, chances are I'll be more calm in my relationship to you and you'll be more calm, you'll pay it forward. Right. And we have to make a change in the world. And, you know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to make in the world. So if you want to create peace, you have to be peace. Tall order. So each of us has to, I think, you know, from my belief, everyone needs to do, has to find their own direction. This may not be for everybody, okay? But, you know, this is one of the tools that I've used for myself in my own life and with my, the people I work with, the courses that I teach. And I think it can make a real difference. We, do, we need it so desperately. Agreed, agreed. So. Um, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us, the evening, uh, in your case. Thank you for having us. Uh, to everyone who is still on the line, thank you all for joining us uh, the afternoon, the evening, the morning, wherever you are. Uh, in the now. We're all in the now. We're all in the now. Uh, today is Tuesday. Uh, today is Tuesday. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, please stay tuned to more of the incredible programming coming from uh, the Ramaz community and coming from Dr. Dina. Uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Have an incredible week. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, wear a mask, wash your hands, uh, and we will see you all again real soon. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you, Leah. Thank you all. And if you do have questions, you know. Yes, we will, will be, email, we, we, will be, <laughs> we will be sharing Dr. Dina's information uh, in a follow-up email with everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody.